Hello and uh, welcome to Coming Down to Earth, um, uh, the, an online conflict transformation summit, uh, exploring pathways to more healthy and regenerative cultures. Um, and we're really uh, delighted to have some transitioners here with us uh, today to at this very beginning of the conference to talk a little bit about the um, experience of being part of the transition movement and also, you know, the, the, the inevitable brushes with conflict uh, that, that comes out of that. Um, I, I'm going to ask everybody to uh, just spend a little time taking it in turns and maybe passing on to one another to, to allow a, a kind of good flow between us. Um, to introduce yourselves a little bit about your background, and I know some of us have more uh, of a strong relationship with kind of conflict and, and uh, peacemaking processes and others, uh, you know, are more involved in the kind of activist side of, um, of transition. So just a little bit about, um, you know, where, where, your, where your experience as a transitioner and your experience of conflict uh, have come in touch with one another. Um, and maybe we could ask uh, Deborah, could you, could you start us off? Sure. So thank you for inviting the conference. Um, I came to transition to the movement as a peace scholar, activist, researcher of the Israel-Palestinian conflict. And through the years of my study agreement and after the Oslo agreement and watching that fail and being just very disheartened, I started to sort of shift the focus to civil society change as an anchor, as a vehicle to drive a peace process and to come to a certain common set of values that we could unite around. And permaculture and transition values and the idea of inner transition, outer transition being interfaced really uh, resonated with me. And so I spent years trying to um, talking, getting involved with, it, with the network, just learning about them, and then um, trying to establish um, the hub in Israel. And um, I, so co I co-founded the hub in Israel with my bigger intention of wanting to bring the transition movement into the Middle East in any way that I could. I wasn't a transition person. I was, I'm not a permaculturalist, I'm a social anthropologist. But, um, but so there were local activists that I connected with um, and, uh, and that's how that happened. And from there, I then moved to Germany and I lived there for five years. And, and then I came here where I am now, which is in Northern Italy. And the reason why Frieda, my husband and I came here, he's a, a businessman and looks at transition projects or poverty alleviation or reconomy type projects as a social business, as a family business. He comes from family business. So together we have combined our forces and we've moved to this area, this really very pristine, beautiful lake called Lake Orta. And it's a, it's a human scale, self-contained, both historically, but also um, geophysically and, and ecologically space that really lends itself to some really interesting potential work. And so we've begun getting engaged with local activists from Extinction Rebellion to Friday for Future and permaculturalists, plus the mayor, you know, we moved to a particular village in Yasino because we wanted, we knew the mayor who is also open-minded. And so we're in the process now, we've been here a year of learning the language, but also of driving change process. Um, my particular engagement here has been through distribution circles. So we can talk more about that if you'd like, I don't wanna take up too much time. But, um, and I've also developed a model on human needs that sort of shifts the two dimensional triangle of a hierarchy to a more of a matrix 3D understanding of our vulnerability um, as triggers to what drives conflict, which is a perception that our needs are at risk. And so there's a model that I've been developing for 20 years. And I think part of the problem is not having a common way or a framework 
to help relax our nervous systems to understand why do we feel the emotions we feel? How do we begin to become more self curious and, um, and take responsibility for our activations? So there's a lot to say. I'm in the process of writing as well. So, so should I pass it to somebody? Would you like me to pass it to somebody? So why don't I pass it to Anahi? Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Eva and Nuno, for inviting us here. My name is Anaí. I'm calling from Chile in Valdivia in the south. Um, I am part of the transition movement since uh, around four years. Before that, my background has been as transpersonal psychologist and group therapist especially in all the tr spiritual traditions. But one day I was at home and I, is when you have like a waterfalls on you of consciousness and I felt like keep meditating and doing psychotherapy and dancing with the re ecological reality uh, stopped having sense for me. So and then I, had, I started shifting all what I had towards the ecological movement and to the social movement. And I met permaculture, I met transition movement, I met Gaia education. And today I'm very happy to be working in my two main areas that is spirituality and education in Latin America through the transition, transition movement through uh, Gaia Education and also through Casa Latina, that is Jen here in Latin America. We all these, like I said, like twin sisters, webs are webbed together from down up here. Um, and I also would like to express that even though I maybe have a, some theory and experience in community around conflict, I can see in myself and all around. I can look my elders and also look down to the young ones and I am very much still learning how to incarnate, how to deal with conflict. And I really appreciate this conversation and this summit. I have the belief that as humanity, we still don't know how to deal with this. So together, I believe we will learn more and manifest it in, in behaviors more than in words. So this is my goal. Thank you. And I pass it to Don. Well, thank you very much. Uh, great to be here with you all, uh, both in this meeting and the folks who are going to watch this afterwards. Uh, my name is Don Hall. Uh, my history with the Transition Towns movement started back in early 2008. Uh, at that time, I was going to graduate school. And I started an internship with an organization called Boulder County Going Local. Uh, and one of my first tasks was to fill out the application to be recognized by Transition Network as the first official transition initiative in North America. Uh, I was hired on uh, part-time after that internship, then full-time after I graduated, uh, became the, uh, what was my title? Uh, outreach coordinator uh, for Transition Colorado. Uh, we helped launch about a dozen transition initiatives through the state uh, and served as a statewide hub. Uh, after that, in 2010, uh, I went back to my hometown here in Sarasota, Florida, in the good old US of A, and uh, started uh, Transition Sarasota. Uh, I served as the executive director of the organization for about six and a half years, uh, mainly focused on rebuilding our local food system uh, through a gleaning project, an annual 
Eat Local Week, uh, Eat Local Guide, and Investment in Local Food Businesses. Uh, and then in 2017, I came on board uh, with Transition US, our national hub, and uh, currently serve as its uh, assistant director. Um, my passion in this work um, has always been around leadership. Uh, my master's degree is in environmental leadership. Um, and a lot of that addressed the issue of conflict uh, and working uh, effectively in groups. Uh, that's continued in the transition movement. I became a transition trainer in 2010, have done more than a dozen trainings uh, throughout the country, uh, including adapting Nick Osborne's effective collaboration training here to the US, uh, which is a two day in person or uh, six week online training on how to work effectively together as groups. And a big piece of that is uh, conflict resolution, conflict transformation, uh, including nonviolent communication, uh, which I studied with uh, the founder of nonviolent communication, Marshall Rosenberg, before he passed away a few years ago. Uh, and I think I'm going to be talking about that more as part of this summit. Uh, also have a very personal interest uh, in conflict resolution. Uh, I've lived in two intentional communities during my life. I founded one here in Sarasota where I currently live. Um, and I don't know if it's been this COVID-19 crisis, people being out of work, not receiving government assistance, being stressed out about finances, but uh, we've dealt with uh, some significant conflict uh, in the house here lately and uh, would be uh, happy to share some of those experiences and what I'm still learning because I think this is uh, something that we can uh, spend our whole lifetimes uh, learning and developing and perfecting. Uh, so really great, glad to be here, really uh, excited for this whole uh, summit. And I'll pass on to Shunrao. Hi, thank you, Don. Um, this is Shunrao from Japan. Um, I started Transition Japan 12 years ago with my friend when we went to Scotland and London. And um, we started also transition uh, training from the first beginning after um, Sophie and Naris came. So I've been doing transition training for maybe 11, 12 years. Um, um, also, <clears throat> I practiced um, Joanna Macy workshops when she came to Japan and uh so i have uh two communities on um, transition in where i live um in amiyaso here and also transition japan so maybe maybe i'm the only one when we started on uh, transition japan which which is a national hub and i guess i've been practicing Um, handling conflict, but when we have conflict, it's a kind of a drastic um, change of the outer world, like uh, this con uh, COVID-19, or <clears throat> we have been hit by a, a big earthquake in 2011, which just not uh, just it's not a uh, earthquake, but it's a you know nuclear um, explosion in Fukushima. So uh, it's a very difficult situation still because um, other people is suffering from that um, nuclear explosion, <clears throat> but the government or the uh, most of the people are are not aware of it or doesn't care. <clears throat> so, 
So we have been uh, hit by those kind of a uh, uh, drastic uh, outer change. So uh, still practicing the, how to handle conflict within our community is very, very hard. But um, I've been working with other uh, <clears throat> other communities like uh, Pachamama Alliance in US or it's in Japan also. Um, we're kind of um, both, I, I'm in that community too. <clears throat> Uh, so there's a lot of um, practice uh, practitioners of NVC or coaching, and uh, we've been working together pretty well. And recently, we've been um, contacting or working with the uh, Blama Kra Kla um, Kramis. Which is, yeah, yeah. In India, but it's um, they have a <clears throat> group throughout the world, and I think we have a um, very um, common background or common um, aim to how to change the world is uh, from the inside. So I think we have a very good partnership with them too, and that's about it. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I wonder whether th there's maybe a, a kind of another question we could go back back the way with around, you know, the things that and and it may be it may become too much of a pattern. It may be that everyone's noticing the same kinds of things. But the, what are the kinds of things that you've noticed end up being difficult in terms of conflict within groups? And, and I know that this also might be different in different cultures. Um, and I think that's one of the things that, that's, that's hopefully um, going to be kind of emerge from the conference is that, you know, it's conflict is, is not always the same and it's not always handled the same. So is, it, is that something that gets expressed kind of openly in groups? Do people fall out? And if they do, then does that happen over particular things that you've noticed or how does it? How does it pan out in your experience? I think, I think you know, one of the major techniques of NVC and other mediation pro processes, also SE, somatic experiencing, trauma healing practices, where you reflect back, you mirror back. Mm. And I think one of the, one of the first uh, triggers for for what drives conflict is people not to feel seen. Mm. And one of the beauty, the nuanced beauty of, of that active listening process is that it feeds that need. So I do believe that there, you know, that we have different satisfiers of our needs and we have different reasons why we get activated. Um, I do believe that they fall into patterns around either, that they fall into patterns that um, we could almost see on two axes. Um, the pattern that has to do around belonging and being cared for and that you care about me, sort of in shorthand, love, love needs. And the other side around, how do I have impact? How much autonomy do I have? Am I feeling forced? Am I feeling unfairly treated? And so that's sort of, I name that as power. So that's one area that tends to be like, you know, the specific, the details are always culturally specific. Mm. But the fact that there exists consistently, it's there between, and some people in their stories and their histories are more vulnerable to being wounded on one side as opposed to the other. So people give up love for power and people give up power to feel connected. And that's, that tends to be, a, a, it's, it's a profoundly simple, but yet consistent pattern. The other interesting higher, the other interesting axis is the vertical, I find. Mm. And that has to do with um, meaning between survival, our physical aliveness, our juiciness, our pleasure, you know, our lust. Where do we feel like the, the, the sensuality of our vitality, our physical aliveness and, and safety? 
which gets, as soon as we feel threatened, boy, go into an, an activation, which is an embodied experience, right? But on the other side is all of our meanings and our value and who am I and how do I, you know, how do I manifest in the world and what's our, our higher purpose as my individual and as a group. And often you'll find people giving up their values to survive or giving up survival for their values. So you'll have family honor murder, or people go to war, or people will do all sorts of things. They'll kill or they'll kill themselves you know, for their values. So these axes, sort of, in my opinion, they sort of help orient ourselves around um, what happens in the field. But by and large, the first, the first intervention typically is in some way seeing the other side, meeting the other person, fulfilling that need to be acknowledged, appreciated. And that happens slowly and it happens um, through various protocols that you'll find like in NBC or, or in standard mediation or in trauma healing practices. Um, the other thing I, I think that's, that's interesting because at the beginning uh, when you, Nuna, um, right, did I pronounce that correctly, Nuna? Um, that you mentioned that for sort of the raison d'être for, for the conference is to help people get unstuck. Like what makes people stuck? And I think there's a really interesting opportunity and I have, you know, and I'd love to have a conversation around this is that, you know, we often, ref we, when we call a group together to create safety in the container, we try to make it clear that there's no judgment allowed. If there's judgment, judgments are no go. But I kind of, I think judgments are, are so profoundly natural and they're necessary. But rather, like when the judgment comes up, turn it on its head and say, wow, I have a judgment. What is that about? Like, how can we turn the judgment into something really interesting to be curious about? And when we can, when we try to exile judgment from the conversation, we kind of lose an opportunity for a lot of deep learning. And um, so that would just be an interesting conversation to be had is how do people work or rework this inclination to judge and to judge each other, judge oneself, because by and large, judgment is that when you ask people, well, what's so dangerous about being judged? You'll hit on all the needs are put at risk. You know, these eight needs that I've sort of identified, but basically human needs go get risked, get put at risk when you feel judgment is lurking. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really intriguing to mm -hmm. me. So um, that's a really, really interesting and useful map that you just mapped out for us and, and an interesting reflection as well on, on judgment and that, um, you know, the kind of bringing the attitude of curiosity into right. the, the, the field as opposed to just reaction, what, whatever that might be, um, which is sometimes easier said than done, but, <laughs> but always helpful. Do, do other people respond to that? Do, do, does, does, is that uh, map, does that feel like that reflects uh, some of your experience? And can you, uh, can you speak to any of that? Mm -hmm. um, yes, I resonate very much with what you expressed, Deborah, about acknowledging our needs and taking care mutually of them and honoring that our minds also judge and what we do with this. And I like to see very much through many eyes the same phenomenon in, in the center of the table. And I appreciate that our differences make us see much more. Mm. And what I'm seeing from here now, um, adding to what Deborah just shared, is that I can distinguish different um, scales of conflict. I can distinguish mm -hmm. like inner conflicts, mm -hmm. um, relating, relational between two, and also the group conflicts that is so different to approach. 
Um, I can also see that even though we have a lot of cultural differences and beliefs, uh, finally we have a human physical body that works similarly. And it looks like from amoeba to the, our bodies, humans, we tend to like contract when the environment is not comfortable and expand and breathe when things are nice outside there or inside here. And I think that this is something that we can have in common, can be like a ground to also start moving forward. Um, to recognize how my body is, how my breath is, and what kind of emotions and thoughts and reactions with the others come out from attention or from uh, expansion. And just learning is like a ecoalphabetization. I don't know in English the word. It's like a, a alphabetization in an emotional level or in a relational level that at least what I see here in educational system in schools and also in families, no one talks us much about how to feel and what emotions are and, and how to listen to the language of our body. We just listen to our mind so there is a big piece also I want to put here offering for us that we can learn all together to, to take care of our needs <laughs> and to see each other and acknowledge the different knowledge, uh, just judgments because we are different and that is also beautiful. I really appreciate that we are different. And it's so passionate, I can talk a lot more, but I would like to pass it around. I don't know, Don or, or Humira. Perhaps one thing I can, I, can, I can add that is coming alive to me and perhaps that will generate also some things for you, Don and Shunro and all of us is, so one thing is this, uh, this sense, these scales that you mentioned, Anai, uh, these different scales like individual, group, uh, then uh, uh, in relation. I would add structural also because we have structures in place that keep us, again, stuck in patterns of, of leading to conflict. And we can just mention like the way our economy is organized, money is designed all sorts of things related with private property and uh, you know uh, the management of commons so there's a lot of lot of uh, things in our way our societies are organized that are that are leading to to conflicts and to prevent us from le really being in a more healthy and regenerative kind of cult setting of cultures let's say so for me one of the things that i, I would add to this reflection is that's conflicts and the way they roll out are con context specific so depending on the context and you mentioned if there's a const if the context is threatening we will close we will be more defensive and one of the things i see as a pattern everywhere is and it has been mentioned already in some of the talks we had is that that becomes very amplified by growing up and living embedded in societies that are deeply based on an idea of, of separation and of, of competition and that we have to, you know, defend ourselves. So that leads a lot of, uh, of ways that we show up that are actually uh, leading to conflicts often. And another thing is uh, that I wanna share in the reflection is this, some patterns I've been observing, they are coming in all the scales. So it's like fractal. So one of the patterns we meant that come to me is this idea of boundaries that like that adds to the separation so if the separation means there is a boundary between me and and others and then there's a boundary between us as a group and them and all this is a, a, a wrong notion of the world because boundary, boundaries are porous they are more like membranes than actually real boundaries like our skin is not 
close to the outside world, cells are not close to, to the, the space with other cells, and then no group is like closed in their own identity. So that leads a lot to crystallization of ideas of identity, of rigidity of cultures, and all sorts of problems that then we see rolling out as conflict. So I also want to bring that in because I see that rolling out a lot in most of the conflicts I see around in spaces of change. Of um, yeah, of a lot of uh, responding to the problems with the same kind of mindset and attitudes that are that create the problem. So we keep trying to solve crises, uh, making crises worse. <laughs> so yeah, and I guess that's a good segue maybe for Don to to follow up or or Shunro. I guess I can jump in at this point, uh, going in sort of the same order. Um, yeah, I love everything that's already been said. Uh, so I'll try my best not to just simply repeat that, but uh, to complement it from my own experience and all my conversations and observations of different transition and other activist groups uh, that I've been connected with over the past 20 years now. Um, and two things really jump out at, at me as, you know, real challenges for activist groups. Um, one of them uh, we might call our shadow stuff, uh, which I know has already been touched on a little bit. Um, but it comes up a lot. Um, I think that, you know, transition uh, and activist groups can often uh, attract a lot of people that have felt very marginalized and unappreciated and potentially even uh, oppressed and abused by mainstream society. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of... Uh, trauma and triggers that come out. Uh, and all of us, you know, regardless of whether we come from privilege or not, have some shadow stuff that we bring to the table um, that we need to work on continuously. And we're never going to get to a state of perfection. Um, it's not like uh, being enlightened fully enlightened is a prerequisite for participating in transition. Uh, but I do think um, we could encourage more as a movement and in general, uh, people to do that work, that work of the inner transition or inner resilience building or self-healing, self-care. Uh, and to, you know, get to a certain level with that, before we just jump into leadership positions. Um, because that can be very, if we haven't done enough work on ourselves, it can be very detrimental to the groups and movements that we're a part of. Um, it can really drag whole groups down uh, and uh, sabotage their effectiveness uh, and even cause these groups to dissolve. Um, so I don't know exactly how to do that in all ways, but uh, that might be something to explore as part of this. Um, and another one I think is not setting clear expectations and agreements in our groups up front before we run into trouble. Um, you know, there's a tendency in activist groups, I think, to say, you know, in places like the, the intentional community where I live, to say, you know, we're all good people. We're all getting along right now. Why, why go into all that really unpleasant stuff, um, such as, you know, creating group agreements and setting in place a decision-making process and having a conflict resolution process. 
uh, in our groups, um, you know, clarifying our vision, mission, uh, those kind of things. But that work is so important as a foundation because, you know, that we know that groups go through uh, a process, you know, it could be described in different ways. And if in the effective collaboration training I teach, we call it, you know, we refer to the stages of group development, forming, storming, norming, and performing. Uh, but it's very natural for groups to go through a storming phase. It's very predictable that there's a honeymoon phase at the outset, but that that doesn't last forever because we do have real differences and we need to work those things out with each other. And we can actually emerge from that storming stage much stronger and wiser as a group uh, mm -hmm. if we're able to go through it well. But if we find ourselves in the middle of a giant storm and we don't have any processes and procedures in place that we have come to agree to as a group that we hold in common and seek to uphold, uh, you know, we just get spun around in the cyclone. Um, and it's very difficult to decide on how we're going to resolve our conflicts or work through our conflicts when we're in the middle of conflicts. It's much easier to do that in advance. Um, so those are, those are two things that I think might be worth exploring on the, the group level. Uh, and I'll just add one more thing about uh, I think what's happening uh, here in the United States right now um, with, with COVID-19, um, and this is not the only uh, pandemic uh, that we're facing. Uh, we're, we're clearly facing a pandemic of climate change uh, and environmental destruction. Uh, we are uh, experiencing a pandemic of white supremacy and nationalism uh, here in this country, uh, of racism. Uh, we are experiencing a pandemic of crazy conspiracy theories uh, that are often you know, promoted by our president, uh, unfortunately. Um, and so I see this kind of, you know, we've been talking about this for years, but some really uh, growing polarization uh, in this country. And we see it right now uh, between the scientists and people who uh, listen to the scientists who believe, you know, we are not seeing uh, a consistent trend of declining cases yet in this country uh, and that um, reopening everything and going back to normal at this point really risks a second and even bigger spike. Um, and folks who, you know, don't listen to the scientists, maybe they listen to Trump or maybe they listen to Alex Jones um, and they think, we need to get out of here. This is tyranny. This, you know, we need to liberate ourselves. Uh, and some of them, you know, are carrying semi-automatic weapons and uh, Confederate flags. And it's, it's, you know, pretty scary here at the moment. And I think it's a very, uh, very disturbing trend. And I know, you know, the U.S. is kind of in some ways the poster child for this right now, but uh, you know, in a lot of countries uh, around the globe are grappling with this. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think this work is extremely important and very multidimensional. Yeah, conflict on the, on the big geopolitical scale as well as on the, <laughs> the local initiative. Um, scale and uh yeah really striking how uh that sense of polarization 
um, that, that once it's kind of started to spiral, it can get harder and harder to stop. Um, and I guess maybe you recognize that, Deborah, from your, from your map of, you know, that that could be transposed onto what's happening. At, I, I, was, I was seeing Anahi's um, kind of uh, scaling of from the personal outwards as a kind of third dimension on that map. Um, because all of those things happen at, you know, they happen inside of us and then out into into all the levels that we've talked about. Yeah. That, that is precisely the idea. Mm. That it that it happens that one can have personal esteem, but there's also group esteem and larger levels of scale to any of these needs. They're, you know, they're they're um, scalable. And, um, and I think it's really true what um, Anahi was saying that there's, you know, this balance between my need and then the need for the group at the same time. Ruth Cohen, a German thinker, created this uh, principle of TZI. Um, most of her writing is in German, but she, it's a beautiful way of describing the tension between you know, the sort of a triangle of, I have to always keep in balance my personal need the group's needs and the project's needs. Mm -hmm. I once presented that at a transition conference and I believe it was in Tutnes or I don't remember exactly where it was. But, um, and this interesting way of looking at um, the relationship between the different levels of, mm -hmm. uh, of scale and how they interact, particularly as it's relevant to transition projects. Um, so, but I don't want to, but I, I want to transfer it on to the next. Thank you. Um, I, I think we, I think we probably need to move towards the end of our conversation and it, it might be um, good to touch in on things that, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of skills and experience here on things that have worked within groups um, to either, you know, do that beginning well, that, that, that sort of setting up for, for a good relationship and good progress together or things that have worked um, when things have broken down and that, that, you know, that either there has been a good setting up or there hasn't. Um, yeah, and I was wondering, Shunro, um, whether you had uh, noticed practices within your groups that either kind of set them up well for people to work well together or help them um, when things aren't going so well? Uh, I guess when we're working, conflict always, or uh, it happens, or, but since um, transition in Japan, uh, a lot of people are interested or um, withdrawn because um, we focus on, also on inner transition. And also other groups like NBC or permaculture, they um, they work on those kind of subjects. Um, we kind we have kind of a same ground rule or same um, understanding. So anything that happens, we're still trying to struggle and. Um, it's not like before because um, it's it's just not you know activists working in uh, very hard and burnout mm. because of, we know all, the, all these kind of um, uh, <clears throat> knowledge and experience um, we try to work it out and we like um, express ourselves and our needs and you know other people will help so we take a lot of uh, much time not focus on what we want to do we focus on ourselves uh, I think that helps a lot mm. um, so there's a lot of people interest in that um, inner side and they know um, that's it's very important to focus on the inner side, not 
um, not just focusing on what you want to change the outer side. So <clears throat> working with other groups also helps in, um, I think um, we have uh, kind of a good communities or um, different communities will help also. Mm. Mm. So it's like um, I said before, I've been working for 12 years and I had a, a almost or maybe I, I was a burnout, but everybody understood. And I stepped out maybe for a one year and but I came back, but everybody understood about the burnout situation. So they, they took over, but it's easier, much easier to um, work because all, uh, other people understand about this. And I think mm -hmm. that it's helping us not to, you know, collapse. Mm -hmm. We hold each other, we still work out and we discuss. I think that in Japan, um, it's not perfect, but uh, we're still working out and that's helping a lot of other groups and NVC, permaculture, you know, other methods um, that helps a lot. It sounds like there's a really um, a high level of uh, agreement that it's really important to take that time. Um, which is which is great because I think that's half the battle, is yeah. is, is that people in the group really uh, really sign up to that and agree and I think I think it, that's something in some ways that, that transition groups have have learnt the hard way. Yeah. Um, certainly in in Scotland, I know that you know it's it's quite it's you know it's quite a mature movement. Um, in some ways, and I know that although uh, you know Extinction Rebellion, which I've been quite involved with came in with a strong sort of theoretical emphasis on the uh, regenerative culture side, which was great. It, you know, it, it put that much more up front than transition did right at the beginning. Um, and yet still, I think there's not so much general sense among the kind of activists that I know that, well, you know, that stuff takes time and you really have to make space for it because there's an awful lot of like, yeah, let's get out and do another action. And there's, there's burnout and there's conflict and, and kind of, um, you know, a lot of projection and, and blaming of other people as well that, that can just kind of happen around the edges and nobody's really paying attention to it because basically it's, it's still a very new movement and people seem to learn best by, <laughs> by falling, into the <laughs> falling into the traps and, and actually experiencing them. Yeah. Uh, any other thoughts on kind of things that you've you've seen really working, Deborah? Well, I, I would just like to speak to what Don said, mm. just to strengthen what he said. That I think one of the one of the things I learned by teaching on culture, conflict, and community development, I was teaching this course, um, was exactly what Don was naming. That for any thriving community. And it's typically you can look cross culturally that whatever what, whatever a community has its in place mechanism that is ritualized that is known by all the members of the community um, that has a process of a beginning a middle and an end um, that has a way of of marking the stages whether it's a jirga, whether it's sulcha, whether it's, I mean, it, it is all, whether it's a, a standard American mediation or there's always going to be a, although media, American mediation doesn't have community invo involved, but these other more traditional forms do, where the whole community is engaged. And it's really quite exciting to, to study this. And it, it just strengthens exactly what you named, Don, which is that any community and um, needs to have in place a mechanism that's defined and that's understood by all the members. And that even, and when a conflict happens, what you find is that the leadership within the community and its capacity to navigate through the conflict, to communicate through it, 
transform it into something that reaffirms the values of the community, the viability and the sustainability and the resilience of the community to go into the conflict and get out on the other side. And this, I mean, it's, 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 it's an intriguing process, and I just wanted to strengthen down what you said. And I think it's, it would be a very curious um, exploration to find out or to design, to co-design, co-create, what that process might look like. Um, and how do we impose it? I mean, do we impose it or do we introduce it and then it has to be tweaked? I mean, here I am in Italy, and, and there's certain there's certain protocols here of how a community organizes. I mean, I was thinking of getting the priest engaged, right? To get all the members of the community, we're calling a, a, a people's assembly, you know, or a citizen's assembly or one or the other, I don't, you know, whatever would work um, to see how to collaborate, but also to design problem solving. Um, it's just a big conversation. It's just so big and rich. Um, yeah. And, and really taking emotions and working with the brilliance and, and just exquisite richness that emotions provide us to being a source of curiosity. Like, there's a reason behind the emotions we feel. Let's go figure out what they are. You know, that's sort of the invitation to get us unstuck. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to strengthen down what you said, because I think it's really hard. Mm. Yes, I, I would like to add to your question, Eva, in, on what had worked. Yeah. And one thing that I really like about why, what I learned in transition is to have fun together. Yeah. I feel like a very good antidote to whatever is to be sure we have moments, even like uh, planif planified moments in in the community to have fun together. Music, dance, cooking together, whatever, ceremonies, birthdays. That is one. The other that I can see is uh, distributing power and resources. I am happily, very happily watching what is happening today with the Heart Hub Circle in the distribution of power and is healing and is regenerating itself the process. And I believe that if we do this within us, then it's going to overflow outside. And this is something that I really appreciate. Um, and I think prevents also the conflict because conflict comes out very much about power and the fear of losing the power. Mm. And all I do, personally and collectively not to lose power. Mm. And the other thing that comes to me, and I have seen it also in, in our halves here, is the ask for trainings because people say, I want to learn more about nonviolent communication. I know a little bit in theory, we have this little class in that workshop, but I don't know more, I want to practice and then practice communities. Theory is nothing if we don't practice them. So practicing technolo uh, social technologies, and from there, um, what comes is to practice also the collective wisdom to, uh, to this like world uh, shift about the belief that we are separated. No, no, that we are individuals. But really, we, that is just an illusion and science and also all the spiritual and all traditions say that we are interconnected, we are one in the illusion of separation. So let's play the game for a while. Let's take care of our bits that feel our thing that are separated. <laughs> but uh, the collective wisdom as this conversation now, for me is gold, like, is the solution to many things that we learn to create generative conversations. Um, the other side of social technologies is um, learning how our minds have been structured in polarities. 
So it doesn't matter what content we put in the polarity, we can, we can watch that it is a polarity. Here in Chile, out after the last October, in the social um, ex explosion that we have, the, the right and left politics polarity was very much expanded. I, I hear also Don sharing about uh, North America, and I, I, I hear something the same. And even within us, many times I see the ones that are in the inner and the ones that are in the outer, the local action. So if we can step one step back and just realize this is the structure of our minds that is built in polarizations, we can, I think, be free of a lot of this fight between two groups inside of one group. Mm. And this band thing, I see it a lot. And this is very conflicted in the, in the groups. The other thing is vulnerability. Uh, if we learn how to be vulnerable together, uh, I think uh, it's so hard to be fighting with someone that has no arms, you know. It's like if I open my heart and show you my pain and my anger and my wound, it's, it's so difficult. You keep fighting to me. <laughs> so being vulnerable is such a big you'll. And the last thing I can see, I have seen, even though all this doesn't work, <laughs> ceremonies. Um, I have been in Temascals after long meetings in the group assembleas and we don't get to agreement. <laughs> Finally we go to the Temascal and there with this mystery of sacredness. If my heart doesn't open, I don't know how. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, I put all this uh, for all of us to, to have and to deal with conflict transformation because I need to, to say that I don't like when we say resolution because this has like the back idea that something is bad about conflict. And I think something very important in the education now is to acknowledge conflict is part of life. And is everything okay about that? Even though in psychotherapy, I have learned that conflict uh, deepens the, the vinculo, the, the connection. If I stay with someone beyond conflict, love is bigger. And, and when love is proved, um, I feel more safe and I feel more confident. So if we can go through conflict together, the power of the community is much bigger. So, yeah, <laughs> I get passionate. <laughs> I give it there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Anai. And, and you have things to add, Ston? Yeah, just a few final things. Um, I had to move inside because somebody was uh, either mowing their lawn or cutting down a tree or something that was uh, conflicting with me. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, this kind of work is that we're doing, I think it's important to appreciate how challenging it is. Um, that not only are we trying to you know, transform our systems of food and energy and economy and housing and etc. But we're also trying to transform ourselves and we're also trying to uh, transform our culture to really kind of create a new culture uh, on the fly. <laughs> and fortunately, you know, there have been many brilliant cultures through time that have developed uh, processes and philosophies and practices and so forth to aid us with that. Um, but, uh, but it is very challenging. It is very challenging. We're working against the status quo uh, in all of these ways. Um, 
I was recently um, worked uh, with U.S. and Canadian trainers last year to develop a, a transition thrive online training for the first time, kind of a uh, sequel to launch training, um, which was developed by Nuresh and Sophie, uh, but uh, bringing that into the U.S. context and updating it and so forth. And uh, one of the sessions we, we decided to create uh, was called um, Unleashing the Collective Genius, uh, which I think is a Rob Hopkins-ism uh, from, from the very early days of transition. And, uh, you know, he's talked a lot about how that's what transition is fundamentally about, unleashing the collective genius to rise to the challenges of our time. And so we were thinking, you know, how, how do we teach people how to unleash the collective genius if that's our, that's really our aim here. And I was working with uh, a friend of mine, Rebecca Blanco, who's also a psychotherapist and very involved in the inner transition work uh, here in the U.S. And uh, she stumbled upon a, a model called the Thomas Kilman conflict modes. I'm wondering if anybody's familiar with the Thomas Kilman conflict modes. I wasn't. Uh, but it talks about uh, five different styles of uh, being in groups and all of us, you know, manifest these different styles at one time or another. But I think they're very helpful uh, in thinking about how we unleash the collective genius, you know, thinking about um, avoidance when people are just shut down and tuned out in groups, you know, how do we, how do we reach them? How do we reach out to them and get them more engaged? Uh, thinking about competition in groups, you know, how do we diffuse the need for competition uh, in our groups um, so that people don't, because I think competition often comes from a sense of insecurity. Um, and how do, how do we work with that? Uh, accommodation. Um, sometimes we and others uh, fall into a mode of just, you know, yeah, that's okay. I mean, it's kind of like avoidance, but just on the positive, more positive side of things. Just, yeah, that's all good. I'm not going to really express my opinions. But in order to have the collective genius, we need everybody expressing their their opinions and sharing their experience and their ideas. Uh, then they name compromise, uh, which is, you know, something that is part of life. Uh, but we want to go beyond that in transition, I think, to true collaboration, uh, where we're not just compromising, you know, putting, you know, a little piece from here and a little piece from there, and a little piece from here. Um, people might have heard the, the old saying that uh, uh, a camel is a horse designed by committee. Um, so, yeah, sometimes we can design some pretty ugly camels in that way. Uh, sorry, camels. Um, but, uh, you know, collaboration is really about, you know, finding what is going to best serve the whole. And it's, and it's weaving different ideas together and it's getting really creative about, you know, how we can design something that meets everybody's needs. Uh, even if it's different from anybody's ideas as they were initially expressed. And I think this is all part of this kind of conflict, you know, looking at the positive side of conflict transformation not the, the suppression of conflict, but how can we move through conflict stronger and how can we embrace conflict? Mm. Uh, and that's really exciting to me. I don't have all the answers, but. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that was me thinking. <laughs> I mean, I guess if any of us had all the answers, we would all be, we'd be sorted. We could, <laughs> we could all go home, it would be so easy. But we have to find it all out together, which is, I guess, part of what we're, what we're here to do. And if so we thought think, we all had the answers, that would be just t a terrible conflict. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I think that's probably, 
we need to draw to a close now. I, know Can I, I, I wonder if Shumro still wants to, would like to add something and then I have just a yes, couple sorry. Of comments before mm. ending over to you to close, Eva. Shumro, would you like to share uh, something, uh, something more? No, I think I'm okay. Okay, that's Thank you. great. Thank yeah. you so much. I, I think one, one of the things I was hearing this, I, I mean, I had the, it, a lot of things emerge from me as I was listening to all of you. One of the things that is interesting in this final part of, you know, wishful thinking about a, 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 a happy ending or a final, Final arrival is uh, is very deeply embedded in our in our way of thinking, and I think it's a a, a very uh, mis a big misconception about life because it's just like life is an ongoing unfolding, and we tend we, we had a conversation I think it was yesterday Eve about restorative justice and justice. It is something that people will watch later on in the journey, on the third week, uh, on the second week actually, and. Um, one of the things is striking is justice is always in the making. So we're never going to arrive to a place of justice or peace. And for me, part of that, a, a fool, because part of that is the dynamics of life is to work out with ten, uh, creative tensions with, with apparent op opposite, for, opposite forces. So for me, one of the things is like thinking in, a, in terms of polarities as a, actually a triad and saying, and you guys mentioned, I mean, uh, Deborah mentioned the triangle. You even made this kind of a body gesture. So it's really like if we are kind of being pulled aside here, like what do we need to bring these two together in a way that we have a kind of a reconciling force? Because in all of us, every day we have this pull towards you know, stop and slow down and pull towards action. And we constantly have to deal with those apparently contradictory forces and be aware on which is more serving in each moment. But they are not two opposite things that we need to choose and we're going to be always active or always turning to the inside. And so I think some of the things, I, my invitation with the conversation is really like how we can understand that none of this is totally individual, none of the, and that there's this deep intertwining between conflict and trauma. So there's a lot of things we need to deal that are, we might think it's on the on individual level only, but it's actually always collective, you know, heritage from uh, cultures of oppression. I'm, I'm a white guy. I grew up in, I'm a, born in Portugal. So there's a lot of history of colonization. There's a lot of things playing out from the past, from our own ideas of the future in how we are now. And I think we need to hold these tensions in a way that, uh, and I said, don't get into a resolution. Stay with the trouble for as long enough to trust that voices that have not been expressed will come into, into the collective space and allow us to move forward in a stronger way and that's what kept for me from the conversation and i'm so deeply appreciated for uh, appreciative of this opportunity amazing opportunity to have this chance of being here with you mm. yeah thank you nuno it's it's been it's been an absolute delight um and to uh spend this time with you and to get a little nuggets of all of your wisdom and, and deep experience. And um, I think this will be a really beautiful part of, of starting to ease people into uh, uh, the conference and also conceptualize it in, in terms of the kind of transition movement. Uh, so really, really huge amounts of very heartfelt thanks for you all your time especially you Shunrobe staying up so late to be with us. <laughs>